All right, so um, let me go ahead and introduce, this is Dr. Rick Bedlack, and he is from a small town in central Connecticut. Which town would that be? Cromwell. Ah, okay. And he received his MD and PhD in neurobiology from the University of Connecticut. Um, he came to Duke as a medicine intern in 1995 and stayed to complete neurology residency, neuromuscular fellowship, and master's in clinical research science. He's currently associate professor of medicine neurology, chief of neurology at Durham VA, and founder and director of the Duke and Catfish Hunter ALS clinics. He has particip bleh, excuse me, participated in a variety of research, mostly related to ALS, including basic epidemiology and clinical trials, resulting in more than 40 publications. He has received the Teacher of the Year Award for Duke Neurology and was recently named Patient Advocate of the Year by the American Academy of Neurology. So please, um, let's welcome Dr. Bedlock. Thanks. Thank well, thanks, King. It's a pleasure to be over here again. It's been many years since I was last here. The main thing I remember about this place is all the locked doors that I had to go through to get to my classroom every day. So the first thing you might be wondering as I stand up here in front of you is, why am I dressed like this? Well, I do have a reputation for sort of being a strange dresser, but today is exceptional. I dressed in what I would call my ringleader or game show host outfit. And the reason is, what I'm about to present to you is what I think is the most amazing, most spectacular, and also most horrifying disease I've ever seen. It's a disease I see most of the time now, most days here. It's called ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And to sort of frame everything else that's going to come after it, I wanted to present you with a patient. It's a lady that I saw several years ago now, Mrs. B. She gave permission for me to present her case. 54-year-old lady who came in to me saying that um, for about six months now, she was starting to have trouble speaking. Came on kind of gradual. At first, it was only when she'd had some wine, but as time went on, it was all the time. And by the time I got to see her, she was needing to use her hands to communicate. She was also, over the same period of time, having trouble with her swallowing. And in fact, by the time I saw her, she'd lost a lot of weight. Um, she was having difficulty controlling her secretions. And interestingly enough, this was the main problem that was now keeping her from going out anymore because she was embarrassed about the fact that she was drooling all the time. For about three or four months, she noticed that her head was falling forward and that was causing a lot of neck pain. And over that same period of time, her hands were getting weaker and she was having difficulty dressing herself, cutting up her food. Uh, people in her family had to help her with those kind of things. And finally, over just the past month, she was having difficulty breathing, so that any little thing she would do, she would get short of breath. Um, over this amazing period of changes, she was noticing that the muscles in her body were getting smaller and that they were twitching. And importantly, she didn't have any problems with her eyes or any problems with her real bowel or bladder function, except for the fact that she was constipated. She had pain, she was depressed, and um, she was also having a whole bunch of social problems. You know, she, she was trying to work. She was the main breadwinner in her family, and all this stuff was getting in the way of her working. She was taking more and more days off. She was trying to support her husband. That relationship was becoming strained by all this. Um, relevant in her past medical history, no tick bites, no HIV risk factors, never went to the Persian Gulf or served in the military, and most important of all, no family history of anything similar. So on her exam, the first thing I noticed was that when I passively moved her arm, she had a lot of pain in her shoulders. The next thing I noticed is that she really was short of breath. She was using her accessory muscles to breathe. We did some bedside spirometry, and her forced vital capacity was only about half of what it should be. Her speech was profoundly abnormal. Um, again, I had to get her to repeat and sometimes write some things down for me to understand what she was saying. Otherwise, cognitively, she seemed to be okay. Her muscles were twitching all over her body, and they also were quite atrophic, quite shriveled. She had significant amounts of weakness in her arms and her legs diffusely, but sensation was totally normal, coordination was totally normal. Her reflexes were very interesting as well. They were pathologically brisk, off the charts. When you'd hit her biceps, she'd get spread into her finger flexors. When you'd hit one knee with your reflex hammer, the other one would move. And she had all these pathologic reflexes that are not supposed to be there in adults, like Bobinski signs. When we scratched the bottom of her, her foot, her toes would go up instead of down. Um, she'd had a workup already by the time she saw me through multiple different physicians, including a primary care physician and a neurosurgeon, and that included imaging studies of her brain and cervical spine. She'd also had nerve conduction studies with an EMG that showed that she had a widespread problem with her motor neurons that affected the motor neurons in her face, in her arms, and in her legs. They all were sick. And she had a whole bunch of blood tests, HIV testing, Lyme testing, perineoplastic antibody testing, CAT scans of her chest and belly looking for cancer, all that was normal. 
so unfortunately, at the end of that visit, I was able to tell her pretty certainly that she had ALS. Okay? And she had a bunch of questions. She was a really smart lady. She had a whole bunch of stuff written out. The first was, what is the deal with this funny name, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? Second question is, how could you be so sure this is what I have just from looking at me like this? All the other doctors did all these fancy tests. How come you don't need them? The next question was, okay, if this really is what I have, what's going to happen to me now over time? Next, why did I get this? Can I pass it on to my kids? And finally, you know, is there any hope for me? I came all the way here to Duke. I mean, what can you guys offer against this terrible disease? So let's start with the first question that she asked. Why this funny name? Well, some people actually don't call it ALS. Some people call it Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, that's not because Lou Gehrig discovered it. Uh, it was actually discovered a long time before Lou Gehrig got it, but he got it at the height of his career and probably was the most famous athlete in America at the time that he got this disease. It really took him down in the prime of his career. And ever since then, it's been called Lou Gehrig's disease in the United States. It's not called that outside the United States. Sometimes outside the United States, it's actually called Charcot's disease, which is probably a more appropriate name for it because this is the guy who first described it in the literature, French neurologist Charcot. Charcot's also the one who gave it this funny name. <clears throat> and the name actually means something. Amyotrophic means muscle atrophy. And Charcot uh, proposed that that was probably happening because of the lack of some sort of growth factor, hence the term amyotrophic, muscle atrophy from lack of a trophic factor. He might be right. He also uh, put the term lateral sclerosis in there, and that was because when, he, when these patients died, Charcot did autopsies. And what he was able to show is that when he took out the spinal cord, the lateral borders of the spinal cord, um, where the cortical spinal tracts are, were really hard and stiff. They were very scarred. So amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's hard to pronounce, but it has meaning. So what is this? Well, fundamentally, the definition has not changed since the days of Charcot. This is a neurodegenerative disease that's fairly specific for motor neurons. Now, most of you may know that there's two populations of motor neurons. There are the so-called lower motor neurons, depicted in red here. Those are actually anatomic cells. They have cell bodies in the um, anterior horn of the spinal cord, okay? And those cells have axons that leave the central nervous system and travel down the extremities and actually synapse on muscles in our body. And then there's also the upper motor neurons, and these really are more conceptual. There isn't just one cell that's an upper motor neuron. There's a whole bunch of different tracts that comprise what we call the upper motor neurons, including the cortical spinal tracts. These are cells that have their cell bodies in the brain or brain stem and stay within the nervous system. They never leave the central nervous system. So both those groups are involved. Now, what happens when those cell types go bad? Well, clinically, you get some pretty profound signs on exam. So when your lower motor neurons go bad, you get atrophy, fasciculation, and fixed weakness. And so muscle atrophy, you can see in these pictures here, that's muscle atrophy in the tongue, muscle atrophy in the thenar eminences at the base of the thumb, muscle atrophy in one leg. You get fasciculations, which are muscle twitches, and you get fixed weakness, which means that just standing there at the bedside, I can tell that somebody's weak, just testing them with my own arms and legs. When the upper motor neurons go, ba go bad, you also get some interesting exam findings. And here what you get is what's called spasticity. Spasticity is an abnormality in muscle tone, but it's distinguished from another abnormality called rigidity by the fact that with this abnormality, two things happen. One is the amount of tone that you have is proportional to how fast you try to move the affected limb. So if I've got a spastic left arm and I move it very slowly, you might not notice much of an increase in tone. But if I try to move it faster, now you start to see that you're getting a lot of resistance. Okay? The other thing that always goes with spasticity is hyperreflexia. And I described that to you in, in my patient, Mrs. B. When, when you tap on the reflexes in patients with spasticity, you oftentimes get spread. So tapping on a bicep reflex, you get the fingers flexing. Sometimes it's bad enough where you actually get clonus. Tap on the bicep reflex and you get a sustained and, and sort of rhythmic response. And finally, with spasticity, you get the emergence of primitive reflexes that are there in us, in, in many of us when we're babies, but are not supposed to be there anymore in adults. The most famous of all those is the Babinski sign, which is shown in this picture here. When you scratch the bottom of someone's foot with something sharp, and they're an adult, the toe should go down. When you do this in somebody who has spasticity, the toes actually flare out and go up, okay? 
So it's an incredible combination of findings, both lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron findings, widespread throughout the body. I think it's safe to say that there really is no disease that produces an exam as dramatic as ALS. When medical students come through my clinic, their eyes pop out of their head when they see their first patient with ALS. They can't believe all the findings on exam. Believe it or not, Charcot was diagnosing this disease back in the 1800s using these physical findings, and that's still how we diagnose the disease today. There isn't any kind of lab test that we can use to prove that somebody has ALS, okay? So the way that we make a diagnosis now has gotten a little bit more scientific. We look at the number of body regions that have these lower and upper motor neuron findings that I just described to you. And we divide the body into four regions. The bulbar region, which is basically the face and mouth. Um, the cervical region, which is basically the arms. The thoracic region, which is the chest. And the lumbosacral region, which is the legs. So we've got those four regions. And we say to ourselves, how many of these regions have upper motor neuron findings? How many of these regions have lower motor neuron findings? And that allows us to assign a level of certainty to the diagnosis. So for example, if somebody has upper and lower motor neuron findings in only one region, then they get a diagnosis of clinically possible ALS. They move into two regions, it's clinically probable. If they move into three, it's clinically definite, okay? It's, it's a, fa a fairly clumsy system for making a diagnosis. And the biggest problem with this, and the thing, one of the things that's really impairing our ALS research, is that to make a diagnosis of ALS that's probable or definite, which is what we think you need to get into an ALS research study, it takes about 14 months from the time that you have your first symptoms until the time that you can get that diagnosis. And in that 14-month period of time, it's been estimated that you lose about 50% of your motor neurons. So by the time someone can get into a trial now in ALS, they've lost 50% of their motor neurons. So we're really behind the eight ball in terms of finding disease-modifying therapies that really make a difference just for this alone. So next question Mrs. B asks is, what's going to happen to her? Okay. Well, in general, everybody with ALS goes through the same sequence of events. The disease tends to start gradually, and it tends to steadily progress. And for most patients, they're going to have to make some very difficult decisions over about a three to five year period of time. And those decisions include, how am I going to stay nourished? Because the swollen muscles are going to go. And so that means, do you want a feeding tube or not? How am I going to continue to breathe enough to keep myself alive? Because eventually the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles completely go. And so that means a decision about a tracheostomy and a ventilator. Now, one of the things that's very important and another thing that hinders our research, we don't fully understand this, is that there's tremendous variability across patients. So this is, a, this is an average. About 50% of patients would, would have this time course of three to five years where they'd have to make these decisions. But, but there's significant variability. So just in my clinic alone, I've had patients go only a few months from the time they had their first symptoms to the time they had to decide about a tracheostomy and a ventilator. And people have described patients going for many decades before they've had to make these decisions. There's a famous physicist depicted on that slide, Stephen Hawking, who's now had ALS for more than 50 years, okay? Now, he eventually had to have a tracheostomy and a ventilator and a feeding tube, but it wasn't for many decades that he had to have those things. And even now, he continues to be very productive despite far advanced ALS. So again, I, as patients go through this, you saw some of the problems that Mrs. B was struggling with, but I just wanted to highlight those. When the, when the bulbar muscles start to go, people lose their ability to speak, swallow, lose their ability to control their secretions. When the neck muscles start to go, many times they get a head drop, which makes their head fall forward. It's very uncomfortable. It also means that the, uh, the arms and the hands start to go. And so all these things that we take for granted every day, our ability to hold things, to write, to dress, to feed ourselves, they all go. When the, when the legs start to go, of course, people start to lose the ability to ambulate and then eventually to stand at all um, and then eventually even to participate in transfers. The, the, the inter, intercostal and diaphragm muscles mean that breathing goes, and this problem kind of sneaks up on folks, oftentimes manifesting itself at first when you're just lying down. So the first thing that many patients complain about is they're not sleeping well with this disease, and they don't know why. It's often attributed to anxiety, and sometimes it is that, but other times it's the beginnings of a problem with respiration, sleep apnea from weak diaphragm muscles. There's a whole host of other problems, too, that go along with this that are not directly the result of the motor neuron disease. You, you heard about some of those kind of things that Mrs. B was struggling with. 
So many of these patients have pain. Now, degeneration of motor neurons doesn't hurt. The problem is that when you get stuck in a position like this for long periods of time, it starts to create stress on your ligaments and your bones. Your body's not designed to walk around in that position all day long, so that starts to hurt. Many times people have problems like constipation because they're not moving around as much and they're not taking in as many liquids. Liquids are affected worse than solids as far as swallowing with this disease. Many times patients have tremendous social dysfunction. They're struggling with how they're going to pay their bills as they transition from you know, being in the prime of their life. This disease usually affects people in their late 50s, which is sort of right in your most productive years. So they're having to suddenly change everything and figure out how am I going to get out of this job and continue to pay the bills. They're struggling with their identity. Some of these folks, like Mrs. B, was, was the breadwinner in the family. Now, you know, what is her role now, now that she's going to be disabled from this disease? They're struggling with uh, the social impact of this disease in terms of their friends. People struggle with when to tell their friends and how much time they want to spend with their friends because they don't want to be a burden on them. And it's not surprising that more than half the patients in the clinic that, that have this disease wind up with depression and or anxiety disorders too. Okay. So, it's a tremendous disease. It really has an amazing, horrible impact on people. The next question is, why in the world does it happen? Surely after 100 years, we'd have some clues. The good news is we do have some clues. The bad news is the clues haven't yet translated into a better way to treat patients. Okay? So, we now know that there are two broad types of ALS, which are distinguished in terms of what starts the disease in the first place. Okay? So, one broad type of ALS is called familial ALS. And that's caused by a disease-causing gene, a mutation that actually causes the disease. This is the minority of patients with ALS. Only about 10% of folks have this. We now have identified 15 different genes. And in each gene, there's multiple different mutations. Uh, and, and in most of these, can lead to a phenotype that looks just like Mrs. B. Okay? Um, now, I'm not going to go through this big, long table in detail. But I put it up here because I think this is very important for three reasons. The first is as we learn about these mutations, we actually develop a blood test for ALS. Okay? It's now possible to screen for some of these mutations in clinics. So someone like Mrs. B who comes in very early, who has a very astute clinician, could actually send as a panel of tests for other things, ALS genetic testing. And if that comes back positive, then we know what's going on. Okay? Not, it's not an ideal genetic test. It's not an ideal uh, diagnostic test by any means, but at least it's something. The second reason it's important is we can say, well, okay, a lot of these things are pretty rare. Some of them only affect single families. But is there anything in common across all these different genetic subtypes of familial ALS? And it turns out that there is. Almost all of these genetic subtypes cause problems with protein processing in the cell. And so now we've really started to focus on what particular steps in protein processing might be underlying all types of ALS. And the third reason why these things are important is because they've allowed us to generate animal models of the disease. Okay? So for about 10 years now, we've had animal models. Most people use the mouse, but we also have a rat, and we have a worm, and we have a fish, and we even have a fly. And these animal models, each one of them has you know, their pros and cons. So for example, the, with the fly, it's very difficult to get reflexes. You have to have a tiny hammer and you have to hit it in just the right place. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, don't actually, we don't actually check reflexes in the fly. Um, so what about the rest of the folks? 90% of people don't, don't have this familial ALS. They have what's called sporadic ALS. There's no family history of disease in these people. Well, believe it or not, even in people who have no family history, occasionally you can find a disease-causing gene. Now, how in the world does that happen? Well, probably happens because somebody has to be the first mutation in the family. These are de novo mutations, but they're incredibly rare. So, you know, 89% of people with ALS have sporadic ALS where there's no disease causing gene. So, what in the world is the cause? Well, like many diseases, we think it's a combination of a susceptibility gene or genes and some kind of environmental exposure. And unfortunately, despite having some incredible tools over the last few years, like whole genome microarray, we still haven't figured out the genetic susceptibility factors for sporadic ALS. So from candidate gene approaches, we've seen that polymorphisms in a gene called PON, peroxinase, ANG, angiogenin, HFE, hemochromatosis gene, and VEGF 
can all segregate with ALS in some populations but not others. From whole genome microarray studies, we've identified three genes, DPP6, FLJ10986, and ITPR2. The last of these regulates intracellular calcium. This is a protein that's found in the anterior horn of spinal cords, but we don't know what it does yet. And this protein actually regulates potassium channels, which we didn't really think were involved in ALS at all. The sad thing about all this is that even though millions of dollars are being put into this kind of research, nobody's finding anything that agrees. It's very difficult to get studies that, that repeat. And some of, some of us are now starting to think that it's probably more complicated than one susceptibility gene. There might be multiple susceptibility genes that have to line up in just the right way. Plus, you might have to get the right environmental exposure. So we've looked for environmental exposures in a number of different ways. So you can look for environmental exposures with what are called cluster analyses. Yeah, question. Just what's the prevalence of the disease? The prevalence of the disease. So uh, it's believed in the United States that uh, there's probably about 30,000 people living with the disease here. It probably has a prevalence of around 1 in 20,000. Okay. So um, exposure. So we can look for clusters. It is a rare disease, so that question was, was a perfect time. It's a very rare disease, and so when, when a bunch of cases show up at once, it's a pretty obvious cluster. And the other thing we can do is we can do case control studies. So we can look within our clinics take a whole bunch of patients with ALS and try to match them to sort of where they came from and uh, age and sex and race and things like that and look back over their lives before they got ALS and see if there's anything different between the cases and controls. And unfortunately, once again, we have a lot of interesting things, but we don't have a lot of replication across studies. So um, some studies have suggested that there might be a toxin that might cause ALS. And Probably the most convincing evidence there is the situation on the island of Guam. So um, once upon a time, there was a uh, native people of Guam called Chamorros, and they had about a 50-fold <laughs> increased risk of ALS compared to anywhere else in the world. And so for 50 years, people descended upon Guam to try to understand this. And what's interesting is over the past decade, the risk of ALS in that population has gone all the way down to almost normal. We still don't fully understand what happened, but there are some theories. So the first theory was that this population used a bean on the island called the cycad bean. And they used that bean to make flour. And in that bean, there is a neurotoxin called BMAA. And if you don't prepare the flour properly, you could ingest that neurotoxin in its intact form. The problem with that theory is that folks sort of 20 years ago did some calculations and said there doesn't seem to be any way that a human being could ingest enough of that BMAA from those beans. You'd have to eat tons, literally tons, of those beans to get enough neurotoxin. So that theory kind of fell back a little bit. And then the proponent of that theory actually came up with sort of a modification, which was the other thing that these Chamorro people eat are flying squirrels. They like to make flying squirrel soup. And guess what the flying squirrels eat? They eat the cycad beans. And they concentrate the BMAA in their meat. And so if you ate enough flying squirrels, you could get enough BMAA to cause a neurodegenerative disease. And what's interesting about that theory is that as the risk of this disease has gone down to almost normal, so has the population of flying squirrels become extinct on Guam. There's a temporal relationship between the two. Yeah. So then in creating the mouse or the, the animal models in general, what is your how did you go about doing that? Well, first of all, I can't take credit for that. I wish I did create that, but um, that was done before my time. That was probably now 12 years ago. Um, and so the way they created the animal model was by inserting a disease-causing gene, the SOD1 gene. We don't have a model of sporadic ALS. We only have a model of familial ALS type 1. Yeah. We're going to get into more of that in just a second, why that's a problem. Yeah. So, so the jury's still out on the Guam thing. Um, the next big sort of interesting suggestion of a possible toxin is that there seems to be an increased risk in veterans uh, of ALS. And so we first learned about this uh, probably about seven years ago. Um, folks coming back from the pers first Persian Gulf War were about twice as likely to contract ALS compared to veterans who were here in the United States who never left, suggesting that they were getting exposed to something. Yeah age-adjusted, two different studies with different methodologies found the same thing. 
A couple of years after that, somebody actually went back through the um, National Cancer Database and looked at causes of death in that massive registry. And they looked uh, at, at ALS as, as a cause of death. And they found by doing that that it seemed that veterans, no matter when or where they served, were about twice as likely to die from ALS as non-veterans, suggesting that it might not have anything specifically to do with the Persian Gulf or that that's a cluster within a cluster. So we still don't fully understand that. We have a project underway called the VA ALS Registry where we've collected more than 2,000 veterans with ALS and we're carefully studying their past medical history and where they traveled in the military. And we even have blood samples on, on a lot of these folks to try to look in the blood and see if we can see anything, either genetic or environmental, that could have potentially caused that. And then the most recent of all these sort of toxin things is the question of whether statins might be a trigger for ALS. This actually came from a very weak methodology in which somebody was using something called Vigibase. Vigibase is a database that, um, that is set up for people to take post-marketing surveillance information about a potential um, new complication of a medication that's FDA approved. And so somebody noticed that folks were calling on the phone and saying, hey, I got ALS shortly after I started taking a statin and I'm suspicious that there might be a relationship. So there was a slightly increased number of those compared to the relationship between any other neurodegenerative disease and starting a statin. Now, I will say that subsequently people have looked within their own clinics and there doesn't seem to be any relationship between people taking statins, getting ALS, and people not. Um, so the jury is still out on that one. Probably only a prospective study is going to be able to answer that. Um, some other very interesting exposure possibilities, athleticism. So people who've done case control studies have looked back over the lives of folks with ALS and found that people who get ALS are twice as likely to be, um, have lean body mass index and twice as likely to have participated in varsity sports as folks who don't get ALS. And so for those of you like Barb who've known me for a number of years, you probably have seen that I've been letting myself go. And this is, this is part of the reason. <laughs> Smoking, high-fat diet, and possibly trauma are also environmental uh, exposures. So how are we ultimately going to solve this problem? Well, first of all, the good news is that we went to Washington last year and we lobbied Congress and we got a national ALS registry off the ground. And so if, if we can actually keep it funded, um, we will soon have a, a giant, massive database showing us where all the ALS is in the United States, which will be incredibly valuable for looking for clusters. Okay. So I think that's going to be helpful. Yeah. Quick yeah. Is that trauma psychological or physical? Um, so it's actually more from observations in clinic than it is from any kind of big study. And part of the reason is because it's very difficult to quantify a trauma. What I can tell you is that many people who run ALS clinics are under the, are, we've, we've all had the story where a young person who shouldn't be at risk for ALS has an injury in a motor vehicle accident or at work. Say, for example, a box falls on his shoulder while he's unloading boxes from a truck. He has a lot of shoulder pain. He winds up seeing an orthopedist. As things go on, the shoulder pain starts to improve, but he notices he can't lift the shoulder. And the ALS starts there, and then it starts to spread all throughout the body. I've seen that probably at least 40 or 50 times in people who seem to be too young and have no risk factors for ALS. It's it's just very difficult to design a study where you would look at the relationship between a trauma and ALS because, I mean, where do you draw the line between what a trauma is? I mean, if I, if, I, if I bump my leg as I'm going out the door here, is that a trauma? If I start getting ALS in the next few months, does that count? I don't know. Yeah. I think um, the thing that I'm really interested in with the veterans yeah. is are you looking at or will you look at the type of vaccinations that they've gotten? It's a great question. I mean, you know, Barbara's here. She's, she's as familiar with this as anyone. And my, my impression so far is that it's very difficult to get accurate information about things like that. You know, one, one of the things that we found last year, one of our medical students, I'll tell you about this later, but he found that... Um, when he looked at this tremendous variability in progression rates across veterans with ALS, he found something very interesting, and that was that veterans who were in Vietnam seemed to have a faster progression rate than veterans at any, any other place or time. And so the next natural question to ask was, Agent is it Agent Orange? Mm -hmm. And so the kids spent an entire year trying to get records on oh, yeah. 
who actually got exposed to Agent Orange and who did it. At the end of the year, we just said, we're not, it's not going to happen. We're just not going to get accurate information. And I, I mean, I think we could probably get some information about immunizations, but the question would be, is it really complete, accurate information? What do you think, Barb? Um, let me give you a when we first started the National Registry of Veterans with ALS over at the VA um, and did the initial screening interviews, uh, we heard over and over and over again from the veterans themselves that they were suspicious that it had to do with the, the vaccinations. Yeah. But um, we didn't specifically ask them any uh, information on which vaccinations they had uh, received. Yeah. So we really don't have any information on it. Yeah, I'm the coordinator of the uh, gene environment study yeah. with Dr. Schmidt, and we do go into the vaccinations. We ask for particular vaccinations, um, but that information is sketchy. And it comes from the patients. Yes, you know, and that's, it's that's self-reported. It's self-reported. I work at the VA half the time. Right. It's amazing how many times you hear these guys tell the same story, which is, well, geez, before I went over there, I got 20 shots. Right. They don't know. No the one amount. told me what it was. It just mm -hmm. hit me from all sides. Mm -hmm. So who knows? Some, some they're definite about, and some they don't know the amount. Yeah. And we do go for each conflict, like the Vietnam War, and so into all the different exposures that we think they might have been exposed to, and they do recount what they've been exposed to there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about uh, the possible role that DU or depleted uranium could have played um, in the first engagement in Iraq. Yeah. Who knows? It's it's a difficult question. I mean. If that was the case, you would think that there might be a cluster of ALS in that, in that area in the Middle East, which there doesn't seem to be, although we don't have the greatest detailed records there. It, again, I think the National Registry might help us because it might show us, hey, is there an increased risk of ALS in some of the areas where some of the, some of the you know, radioactive waste is stored in the United States? That would be fascinating to see. Yeah, and the, you know, the, the way the weapons also have mm -hmm. the Yeah. Interesting question, yeah. So that's what you're looking at when you're looking at the clusters is what environmental factors are the same? Yeah, I mean, that, so that, that's one way to try to identify an environmental risk factor for a disease is to look for a cluster to say, okay, it, I mean, that's actually a great way to do it with ALS because it's such a rare disease. So you can say, hey, look, this village in Japan, there's a, a village in the Japan in the Key Peninsula that, again, has a 30-fold increase in the risk of ALS. And Again, a bunch of people have descended upon that area and haven't been able to figure anything out. But that doesn't mean we have to give up. I mean, I still think it's worth continuing to try. So my question is, um, are there other comorbidities that are associated with ALS? Um, it seems that some of the symptoms that you, that you mentioned are signs and symptoms of just the progression of death and people with um, say say cancer they or Alzheimer's they exhibit some of these same traits um, well yes and no I mean certainly those people do become malnourished over time like an ALS patient but but they don't develop the upper and lower motor neuron signs that are specific for this disease I mean a cancer patient may, may look emaciated but their, their muscles will actually be fairly healthy I mean their muscles won't be specifically atrophied and fasciculating, and their reflexes won't be pathologically brisk. And you know, if you were to do an EMG to look at their motor neurons, they'd probably be healthy. So yeah, this is a little different. I mean, there's some overlap in how people die, certainly, but um, but this is a little different. Yeah. No, no what? The the neuron the the generation the onset. I mean. I mean, we've talked about all these different mutations. Yeah. Um, but well, that's what we're going to get into next. So, okay. So the first part, the first Sorry. part of it was looking looking at ALS from above and saying, okay, what starts it? Okay. There's, 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 yeah. Well, there, there's two broad categories about what starts it: either genetics or possibly genetics plus environment. In the case of sporadic ALS, the next question is, what happens after it starts? And it's an important question because you know, patients coming into my clinic, it's already started. So I need to now know what events are going on to, to lead to the death of the cells in their brain and spinal cord so I can hopefully intervene and stop that, okay? And so of all the types of ALS, there's one that we understand far better than any others, and that's familial ALS type 1. The reason we understand that so well is because that's the one we've had an animal model of for more than 10 years now, okay? So that's one of those 15 subtypes of familial ALS. In other words, that's about 2 to 3% of everybody with ALS has this type of ALS, but it's the one we understand best. So the first interesting observation is that 
This, this type of ALS occurs because of a mutation in a gene called SOD1. That gene codes for a protein called superoxide dismutase 1, and the purpose of that protein um, is to get rid of free radicals. And so when, first, when it was first discovered, people just said, oh, this makes so much sense. So what's happening here is that you know, this, this new protein that's made from this defective gene, it doesn't work. And so free radicals build up and the cells die. That's wrong. It's exactly the opposite. Okay? So this disease is not happening because of a deficiency in SOD1. The mutant SOD1 is gaining a new toxic function as a result of the mutation. How do we know that? Well, first of all, we know that looking across all these more than 100 different mutations in SOD1 that can cause disease, not all of them even affect the ability of the mutant SOD1 to do its job. In a test tube, at least, it can still catalyze free radicals quite well. The second thing we know is that we can give uh, a mouse with this disease tons of copies of wild-type SOD1, but we can't change the phenotype of the animal. As long as it has a copy of mutant SOD1, it gets the disease. Okay? And then, most impressively of all, we can totally knock out SOD1 genes in these animals, and they don't get ALS. They're not healthy, but they don't get any problem with their motor neurons. And so again, the net result of all these observations is that this mutant SOD1 protein is gaining a new toxic function. So what is it? Well, we still don't know. But we have learned a lot in the past decade. There are a lot of possibilities. The first possibility, which I personally really like, is this, this mutant SOD1 protein is highly prone to form aggregates or clumps with itself. Okay? The reason I like that is because since people started looking at ALS autopsies under the microscope, we've seen protein clumps in the neurons in the brain and spinal cord in all types of ALS. Okay? The clumps are there. And so um, this is very attractive. The other reason I like this is that there's a correlation. When you look across all those different mutations in SOD1, there's a correlation between um, the stability of the resulting protein from a mutation and how fast the disease progresses. And the correlation works like this. The most unstable SOD1 is the fastest disease progression. And I would think it would be just the opposite if the SOD1 had to do anything more complicated than just clump. Okay? So we know some other things about S this SOD1. One is that it can bind to a protein in the cell called dynein, and that's a motor that allows things to run up and down the microtubules. Cells need that to be able to keep themselves healthy on both sides, like a transport system. When it binds there, it slows down transport. And if you inhibit binding there, then you dramatically prolong the survival of this animal model of ALS. Okay? The next thing we know is that this mutant SOD1 binds to the membrane of mitochondria. And uh, when it binds there, it seems to open up something called the transition pore. And that does two things. One is it screws up the mitochondria's ability to produce ATP. And the second is that things that are inside the mitochondria leak out the hole into the cytoplasm of the cell. And those things are potent stimulators of a process called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. That is a final common pathway by which neurons die, cells die in many diseases, including cancer. Okay? So by the time you get there, it's probably too late to do anything. The other thing that we've just learned is that this mutant SOD1 can bind to the endoplasmic reticulum. Specifically, we know where it binds. It binds to something called Durlin-1. And when it binds there, it dramatically slows down the processing of all proteins through the endoplasmic reticulum. Not just mutant SOD1, but all proteins. So protein transport and protein processing in general is dramatically affected. And as it binds there, it does something else which is kind of cool. It causes the release of something that we didn't really even know was in the endoplasmic reticulum called ASC1 out into the cytoplasm. And that's another potent stimulator of apoptosis. Okay? So we've got all these specific binding sites, which now become targets for drugs. Is yes, it's there anyways, but it's usually just sequestered in there. So we were all excited about this. We've got all these events. We want to design drugs to attack all these events. But you'll notice something, which is that all those events were inside a motor neuron, right? 
Well, for 100 years, that's what we're focused on. This is a disease which seems to predominantly affect motor neurons. We figured that's where the, that's where the action is. We might be wrong. Just in the past year, it turns out that someone's done some experiments to suggest that the money may actually be in going after events in the cells that live next to motor neurons, which are called glial cells. So here's the series of observations. The first observation was that with some fancy genetics, you can make an animal model in which the mutant SOD1 gene is expressed only in motor neurons, and that animal doesn't get ALS. Okay? Now, when that experiment was done 10 years ago, people didn't believe it. They thought that the expression was probably just too low to cause disease. The next thing you can do is you can make chimeric animals where just randomly some of the cells in the animal are full of wild-type SOD1 and some of the cells are full of mutant SOD1. And you can sacrifice these animals and you can look at their spinal cords. And what's very interesting is you see these big pockets of surviving motor neurons in the spinal cord. And so people said, oh, well, those must be the motor neurons that are full of the wild-type SOD. Not so. Randomly, the motor neurons in there might have wild-type or might have mutant SOD. But in every single case, when there was a surviving pocket, it was surrounded by glial cells that had wild-type SOD1. Okay? The next thing is you can do an experiment in a culture dish. And you can co-culture motor neurons and glial cells. And it doesn't matter what you put in the motor neuron. It matters what you put in the glial cell. You can take motor neurons and culture that are full of mutant SOD, and as long as you co-culture them with glial cells full of wild-type SOD, they seem happy. Okay? And then we had the most dramatic experiment of all, which I think is probably the coolest experiment in the history of ALS. So this was just done last year by, by a group at UCSD. And um, what these folks did is they, um, they created these special mutants in which the SOD1 mutation would only be deleted in certain cell types. So all cell types would, by default, have the mutant SOD. But in certain cell types, they attached the mutation to something that, when it came into a chemical in a specific cell type, would inactivate the, the gene. Okay? So kind of the opposite of what the first guys did. And so they selectively deleted the mutant SOD1 just in the motor neurons, left it in every other cell type. Okay? So this is kind of like what we'd be trying to do with our drugs going after the events in the motor neurons. And guess what happened? They slightly delayed the onset of disease in these animals by doing that. But once the animals started to show evidence of disease, they progressed and died just as fast as they had before. We didn't affect progression at all by going after the events in the motor neurons. On the other hand, when they selectively deleted the SOD1 mutation in the glial cells, onset seemed to be at the same age, but progression was dramatically slowed. And so what we've learned from these experiments is that there's probably different parts of ALS mediated by different cell types. Okay? So here's what we think is going on in familial ALS. So this is a normal healthy cell here. Okay? This is the motor neuron attached to the muscle. You've got a microglial cell and an astrocyte, which are glial cells. Everybody's happy. Everybody's doing fine. Now ALS starts. Okay? And so within the motor neuron, things start to happen. And we talked about what those things are the mutant SOD protein starts to form clumps or aggregates. It starts to bind to the dynein protein, which screws up axonal transport. And so the most distal part of the cell starts to contract away from the muscle. The mutant SOD binds to mitochondria, and the power plants of the cell start to run down, not producing energy like they should. Also, they start to spill things out into the cytoplasm that wants, makes the cell want to kill itself. Now, the cell realizes it's in trouble. And so what it tries to do is it tries to secrete some of this mutant SOD out into the cytoplasm. Okay? And that secreted mutant SOD we now know binds to something that's outside the cell called chromogranins. That combination is a potent activator of glial cells. Okay? So now in the early phase, which probably determines the onset of the disease, all the events are happening in the motor neuron. As we move into the symptomatic phase, which probably determines progression, now the glial cells are getting busy. And what they're doing is instead of protecting the motor neuron like they're designed to do, they're attacking the motor neuron. And they attack it in different ways. One of the things they do is they secrete chemicals onto the cell, which are free radicals, which activate an immune reaction against the motor neuron. And the other thing they do is they act to phagocytize or eat the motor neuron. 
Okay? So the net result of all this is that we've started to consider the possibility that we might need to design drugs to affect glial cells if we want to affect progression. Hello? Yeah. I was going to ask if there's any correlation with oligodendrocyte demyelination. Um, not that I know of. Not that I know of. Um, so we don't know of a role for the oligodendro oligodendrocyte in this process right now. It seems to mostly be the astrocyte and the microglial cell that, that we're focused on. There's not a lot of demyelination in ALS. It's mostly exon loss. So, so it's an amazing story in my opinion. Unfortunately, it's a story that's really just sort of focused on one very rare subtype of ALS. And so it's fair to ask, can you generalize all the things you learned about this one rare subtype to people with sporadic ALS? Well, when we look in the tissues of people with sporadic ALS, we can find a lot of the same kinds of things that we find in people with familial ALS type 1. Genetic and transcriptional disturbances, protein aggregation, mitochondrial dysfunction, cytoskeletal derangements, all the same kinds of things. And so we've been under the assumption for several years that it's basically the same disease. Just starts in a different way and then from there it's the same. But again, just recently we've had an observation which has made us a little nervous. So there's a protein called TDP43, which is a tar DNA binding protein. Okay, it's involved in protein processing. <coughs> and this protein turns out to be one of the major components of those clumps of protein in people with sporadic ALS that we've been seeing under the microscope. We never knew what was in those clumps until just the past couple of years. And so people have looked and they said, okay, well, let's stain these clumps with two stains, one for TDP43 and one for ubiquitin. Ubiquitin's a tag that cells put on proteins they want to get rid of, and we knew that neurons were tagging these clumps, but they were having difficulty getting rid of them for some reason. And, and, and let's ask, does the ubiquitin and TDP43 co-localize in these clusters? Well, as you can see here, ubiquitin stains green, TDP43 stains red. When you merge them together, you get yellow. So in sporadic ALS, yeah, TDP43 is in those ubiquinated clusters in the cell. What about in familial ALS? Well, in all the types of familial ALS except for one, the answer is yes. So once again, green and red, yellow. Green and red, yellow. Okay. Where is it not happening? Where do they not co-localize? They don't co-localize in familial ALS type 1. And so this suggests that the one type of ALS that we understand best may be fundamentally different from all the other types of ALS because this one key protein, TDB43, is not in the same place something different is happening with the downstream events. Okay? So this has us kind of nervous about our animal model. All right, so we've made a lot of progress. There's still a lot of mystery. But at the end of the day, what can we do for patients? I mean, 100 years worth of research, can we do anything for patients? Well, part of what inspired me to go into this field was that when I was a resident here in the late 90s, I saw my first patient with ALS. And I remember just having to go back into the room with the attending and break the news about this terrible disease and tell them about all the difficult things that were going to happen to them and at the end of it all to be able to tell them that we really didn't have much to offer. You know, at the end, if you became uncomfortable, we could offer hospice. But at that time, we had nothing, absolutely nothing. And I thought that was kind of crazy. Here we are at Duke. We've got to have something for these folks, right? So what I decided to do was um, after reading this article that came out in the late 90s, which was basically uh, a bunch of ALS experts from around the world who sat around a table and shared their collective wisdom about different things they were doing over the years to make the, the lives of these patients better. I decided to try to implement some of these things at Duke. And so I had to decide, do I want to do it like this guy all by myself or do I want to do it like this? And you see the, the expression on that guy's face? It doesn't look happy. And so I wanted to be like the people in that picture that look happy. And so I decided to try to get a team together to help me with this. I knew it was going to be a big job. So the members of the team, the first is the neurologist. And I keep, I keep reminding myself to update this old picture of me. Uh, uh, you can see this is really taking its toll on me over the years. But, but the, each team member kind of has stuff that they do, okay? And so... Uh, the neurologist is kind of sort of the go-to guy. The buck stops with the neurologist. I've got to be the one to make the diagnosis, break the news. Periodically, 
assess patients, <clears throat> and they come in about every three months. Let me just get a drink of water. <clears throat> They come about every three months for their assessments. I prescribe the medications, I direct the research team, and I also direct the rest of the care team. I'll tell you just a little bit more about each one of those roles. We talked about diagnosis already. <clears throat> the breaking the news is something I really wasn't prepared for when I started this. Um, I, I don't think I ever had a class in medical school how to break bad news to people. And, uh, you know, it doesn't get any easier over the years. It's still like the worst part of my week is Tuesday mornings when I have my three new ALS patients and I've got to break the news to each one of them. But there actually is a literature on breaking bad news to folks. And if anyone in the room here has to do that, some of the things that I have found useful out of the literature is to always make sure you do this in person. Don't ever do it on the phone. Make sure that you have plenty of time, which is always an issue now as we get pressed to see folks faster and see more patients. You can't rush this, okay? You pull your chair up close, you make eye contact, and you make sure that you explain this to someone without using jargon. You make sure that they have a support system with them. I would never break the news to somebody who was there by themselves. And I, I sort of do it by firing a warning shot that, you know, we've got some bad news today, unfortunately. And then I talk about how we got there, all the things that we reviewed and all the things that we did in clinic. Give them the diagnosis, explain to them what it is, ask questions about what they know about it, and then provide them with supplemental materials to go home. And so we've developed in our clinic now a three-ring binder system. We don't want people to have information overload. So as they go through the disease, we give them modules to put into the three-ring binder to read about the next phase of their disease and the decisions they're gonna have to make. Um, assessment and prediction. Again, patients are coming to see us every two to three months, a lot different in the old days when we would just say, come back if you need us. Every two to three months, they stay there all day in clinic with us. And they see me and an entire team of therapists. And I've got certain scales that I'm paying attention to, a functional rating scale, force vital capacity, a measure of breathing, their weight, their strength, and their reflexes. And the goals of all this work is to try to identify what exact problems they're having right now with living their life, predict the next ones they're probably going to have before they come back here, and give them options for how to deal with those problems. Okay. And so I'm also the guy that prescribes medicines. And in 100 years, we do have one medication that we found that can slow down the progression of ALS a little. It's called Riliazole. It's a glutamate antagonist. People who take this, on average, live about three months longer than people who don't. It's about $900 a month. And we have to do liver function tests to make sure that people don't get hepatitis on this. Um, I never thought I'd spend so much time in my career thinking about drooling and prescribing medications for it, but we've actually got an entire algorithm for drooling here, which I pointed that out in Mrs. B because I never really appreciated what a big issue that was for folks with these kind of diseases. It really is devastating to them socially to have drooling. I mean, you wouldn't think that would be the thing out of ALS that people would pick out, but you know, just with a little bit of, a little bit of work to take that away makes someone's quality of life so much better. So I'll let you look at the algorithm. Secretions can sometimes be too thick, and we have ways to deal with that, which include pharmacology, chest physical therapy, and various devices, including a cough assist device and a chest wall percussion vest. We talked about pain. It's common in this disease, and we have algorithms. We see certain kinds of pain more than any others. Constipation is also common in this disease, and you know how we deal with the constipation depends upon whether we have medical students in the clinic if it's bad constipation, we have medical students, then we can disimpact the patient right there in clinic. If not, we send them to the ER for disimpaction. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So um, I'm also the guy who directs the research. And I'm really proud of this, because we didn't really have any ALS research going on at Duke when I started here. I can't take credit for all of it. Other people were developing it independent of me, but it's all kind of come together. I'm really excited about it. So the first thing I wanted to build was a clinic that took good care of people and gave them a good quality of life. And I did that. It took me a few years, but I did. And we got up to a critical mass. We're actually up to 400 patients now that we follow. And as I got up the numbers, I started to realize that, hey, we need to start offering these people something to give them hope, some sort of research options. And so I went out, found the trial consortiums that were doing all the trials, joined, got them to give me some trials. And as we successfully recruited for those trials, we got more trials. In fact, now we actually have to turn trials down because uh, there's just too many of them to keep track of. But just in the past five years, we've done 
a trial of creatine, aramoclamol, minocycline, levetiracetam, multi-drug cocktail, and also a study of DNA banking. We have a trial going on right now of a medication called Zenvia to try to help people with their laughing and crying. We've got a trial going on right now to look within the blood and spinal fluid to see if there's anything floating around in there in terms of proteins that we might be able to use to diagnose the disease or to follow it more accurately. We've got a medication trial going on right now of lithium, an old medication that you know, has been around and used for bipolar disorder even still to this day. But it turns out that lithium has a lot of interesting things it does in motor neurons that might be useful. We've got trials of two things that might impact quality of life, one called the brain-computer interface and one uh, of different kinds of exercises. And I'll talk more about the BCI in just a minute. Independent of me, other things were happening here. One was that there was a great registry being established at the VA hospital right across the street from Duke. I'm, I'm honored to have been able to work with some of the folks there, Barbara, Dr. O'Donnell. Um, it's a great tool. It's, it's one of the largest and, and really, um, in my opinion, most comprehensive and accurate registries that we have anywhere in the United States. Uh, and we've got medical students that have come and worked within the registry and also come and worked in clinic with me and they've been able to publish multiple papers. That registry is being used in part to do the gene environment uh, interaction study with the um, Center for Human Genetics here. And finally, I said to myself, you know, there's got to be some people doing basic science research at this place that's relevant to ALS. How can I find these folks? And so I started to search the computer and I started to talk to people and lo and behold, I found all kinds of folks in little nooks and crannies doing stuff that's relevant to ALS. Some of them knew it and some of them didn't. And so I established this thing called the Duke ALS Science Group. And uh, we meet every few months. There's a group of us that get together and we try to recruit new members. But uh, I was amazed to find out that somebody here actually had the SOD1 mouse. Here I had an ALS clinic going on for about five years. It was a giant clinic. We were doing clinical trials and I had no idea he was here. He had no idea I was here. And so, I mean, that's a problem, I think, with a big institution is that it's not easy to see what's in the next silo but we're gradually starting to have more interaction between these different groups and that's also resulted in a nice project, a nice collaborative study, something that came out of a, a cancer biology lab that we brought into our clinic. It was a study of a muscle biomarker and we've done just the first pilot study recently. There's medical students involved in this as well. They're using these projects as their third year research projects. I'm also the quarterback of this big team and so on the team we have speech therapists and their job is to assess swallowing, give recommendations about what type of diet people should be eating and when they should stop eating and consider a feeding tube. They're also uh, really skilled in assessing communication and finding ways for people to be able to communicate when that starts to go away. Um, you can imagine if you're mentally intact but your tongue just won't move the way that you want it to, how frustrating that would be. Um, and so that might be an amplifier, it might be a speech generating device you can type with or we're on the cusp of something really exciting which is called a brain-computer interface. This is really amazing technology. We're now able to tap into the brain's electrical signals, put them through a filter, through a translation algorithm, and get those electrical signals to control things like a computer. And so, for example, I can sit somebody down in front of a computer now, and with training, I can put a cap on their head, capturing their electrical signals, I can get them to move the cursor around the screen without moving any part of their body. And now that I can do that, I can actually get them to move the cursor to letters. And with a blink, I can get them to select letters. So now I can get them to actually spell for me on the computer. I can understand what they're saying even though they have no movement. People have also started to use this technology to get electrical signals to be able to control power equipment and even prosthetic limbs. And so in the near future, it may be that somebody with ALS who's completely paralyzed can surf the internet, can drive their wheelchair in and out of this place, can turn the lights up higher, turn the temperature down lower, control their TV, even with no movement, okay? So it's really exciting technology. Um, we have a nutritionist, and again, it's pretty obvious why we would need that. I mean, we have constantly to change the diet uh, of these folks. There seems to be a relationship between weight loss and disease progression, and she tries to help us keep everyone weight neutral, no matter what they can tolerate for a diet. We've got algorithms for when we, when we start to talk about feeding tubes. We've got a neuropsychologist on the team who sees every patient, screens them all for depression and anxiety, and we're starting to learn in recent years that some of these folks actually have subtle degrees of frontal temporal dementia, which he's also screening them for. Occupational therapist who's really skilled in trying to help people figure out how to do things with their hands, no matter how much strength they have left, 
And when total hand function is lost, they, we train the caregivers on how to do those things. Physical therapy for the legs. We've got an equipment vendor right there in clinic, so when our therapists recommend a piece of equipment, this guy brings it out to them the next day, out to their house. Respiratory therapist measures uh, uh, pulmonary function tests right there in clinic. When somebody qualifies for BiPAP, we send it right out to their house. They don't have to do anything else to get it. We've got an algorithm for when we talk about mechanical ventilation, which is in your handout. This is probably the most important person in the whole clinic, more, more important than me. The clinic couldn't run without this person. Stacy, she's our clinic coordinator and also our social worker. And I can't, I can't even begin to tell you about all the things that she does to try to patch up all the holes in people's lives that this disease is creating. Um, she's also built this beautiful library over at uh, the Maureen Road Clinic for people with ALS who can come in there with their families and take out books and DVDs and computer programs and pamphlets on different things that we talk to them about in clinic. So it's a very resource intensive, intensive clinic. And nowadays with, with medicine becoming more and more of a business, it's fair to ask, does it make any sense to do this? I mean, you're, you're pouring out a lot of resources. Well, I got some data, thank God, that it does. The first thing I can point to is that there's a, um, a large study from Ireland and what they were able to show there is that patients with ALS in Ireland who attended multidisciplinary clinics lived on average nine months longer than patients in Ireland with ALS who didn't. Okay? That's three times better than the best medicine we found in 100 years. Okay? Probably the multidisciplinary clinics are keeping people out of preventable complications is why this is working. Also, people have shown that folks who attend multidisciplinary clinics in the Netherlands consistently throughout their disease have higher quality of life scores than folk with ALS from the Netherlands who don't. So we make a difference in quality and length of life. So what's coming down the pike? Well, I told you, I hinted at this, uh, this biomarker study. There's some preliminary data that suggests that there might be a, a group of proteins that when put together like a fingerprint might be a signature for ALS, either in the blood or spinal fluid. And we're trying to see if we can validate that and extend it so that someday we might have a blood test for ALS, which is really, we want to be able to diagnose it much faster. Um, in terms of developing drugs, it's an incredibly exciting era. I'm sure you've heard this from many people from other places in Duke. We've got all these new molecular targets, at least relevant to FALS1. Whether they're relevant to sporadic ALS, we don't know. But once we find a target, we can use this technology called high-throughput drug screening. In the old days, you'd find a target, you'd test a drug in 6 or 12 months, you'd know whether that drug was useful on that target, and then you could move it into animal studies. Okay. Now we can use this technology, which is based upon chips and computers. We can screen every known FDA drug to see which of those drugs are useful on specific targets in just a few days. Okay. Tens of thousands of drugs can be screened in just a few days with this technology. And we're finding some surprises. So when we go after the glial cells, we can find specific things in the glial cells that we want to find a drug to do. And when we screen all FDA-approved drugs, we find out that an old drug named ceftriaxone does exactly what we want to do to glial cells. So it's an old antibiotic. We don't know why it does this to glial cells, but it does. And so the good news there is it's been given to humans for a long time. We don't have to do all the phase one studies. And similarly, we, we can actually find that a drug called pyrimethamine, which isn't even used anymore, but used to be used to treat malaria, that drug potently suppresses the production of mutant SOD1 protein from motor neurons. We don't know, don't know why, but it does. So those two drugs are moving into trials right now. We've got all these new technologies, not just drugs. We have actually now ways to, um, to do gene therapy with viral vectors, and we've had a lot of success in our animal models. We haven't moved those into humans yet. We're on the cusp of launching our first RNA interference trial in patients with ALS. And again, that's going to be mainly for people with FALS1 right now. We have RNA interference against SOD to shut down the production of that. <coughs> and then most exciting of all, which I hope to get through before I completely lose my voice, are stem cells. The reason stem cells are so exciting is because everything else I've told you about today gives us the potential to maybe slow down or, or, or at best stop the progression of disease. Stem cells actually offer the potential to give people back stuff that they've lost. Okay? So without getting into a lot of detail, because I know I've run over my time, I just want to show you an experiment from Johns Hopkins. Now this is, a, this is an animal model of another motor neuron disease, similar to ALS. What they do here is they actually wind up wiping out the motor neurons in the spinal cord with a virus called Simbus virus. 
And over many years of trial and error, they developed a protocol in which they took mouse embryonic stem cells, exposed them to chemicals so they would develop into motor neuron precursors. They injected those into the animal's spinal cord in multiple places, along with two drugs which were designed to suppress the inflammatory reaction that they expected to get. They actually got a second group of stem cells, and they modified those stem cells so that they would secrete a growth factor called GDNF, and they injected those into the animal's muscles. So now you've got these cells in the spinal cord that are hopefully going to start sprouting, sending out processes, and you've got in the muscles cells that are secreting a target chemical. So these guys who are growing out know where to go, because these processes could go anywhere. We want them to go into the muscle. So here's, here's the results of some of their experiments, preliminary experiments. This is five days after the stem cell transplant. This is what the animal looks like. So, I mean, I think you can see the animal's got some serious problems with its hind limbs, okay? It's moving its front paws a little bit, but its hind limbs are really not working. Now, here's the same animal 120 days after transplant. Pretty dramatic difference. And the animal is not walking normally. It's got a little limp, but it's up on its hind limbs. It's walking a lot better. This kind of spontaneous reco recovery never happens with motor neuron disease. Okay. Uh, there, there is still a problem with his right hind limb. It's still he's still limping, but at least he can walk. I mean, I don't think this is the cure for ALS, but it's it's incredibly exciting that it might be able to give people back something they've lost. So to finish, I just wanted to tell you what happened with Mrs. B, okay? So um, we, we talked to her about the disease, told her what to expect, talked to her about all the hope that comes from the fact that there's variability in prognosis, that we have a medication to slow it down, that we have trials, that we have this big clinic at Duke that's going to be there with her all the way through the disease and support her. She decided to go ahead and try the medication. She went into a clinical trial. She had a lot of hope for that trial. She got medications for drooling, for pain and depression. She got a speech generating device so she could communicate with us easily. She decided to get a feeding tube so she didn't have to be so afraid of choking when she would eat and she could keep her weight up. She wound up getting a lot of assistive equipment just over the first two visits in the clinic, including a power wheelchair. She got Social Security disability quickly because there's a new law that people don't have to wait the normal six months when they have ALS. Um, unfortunately, her disease progressed as we expected it would, but interestingly, her quality of life actually improved over time. And one of the amazing things is that she actually sent us pictures about halfway, halfway through our time together of her and her husband on this Alaska cruise that they always wanted to go on. And that always kind of chokes me up a little bit. But for right now, that's a success story in our clinic. We lost the patient, but we did give her a good quality of life for her disease, which we wouldn't have been able to do a few years ago. And so uh, if this is inspiring to you, we can always use more help. Um, there's lots of projects over there. We certainly need people to come out to our walks and help us raise awareness of the disease and, and raise funds. We have t-shirts that we can give you. We don't have any more of this. This particular t-shirt's been retired, but this is one of our medical students out doing a walk with one of our old t-shirts. And if I had to summarize my whole experience with this, it, it is summarized by this quote by Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. In fact, that's the only thing that ever does. So I want to thank you for, uh, for listening to me today, and I'll be happy to take questions. Are we working? The the TDP forty three mm -hmm. protein. Now is this something that we? I, I know you're finding it in the aggregates. Yep. Do we know it's normal? It's a, it's a great physiological question. function. So it's it's involved in um, RNA processing of proteins. In the cell bodies or? Uh, in the cytoplasm. Okay. But exactly what it does is not known. So it's not that old, this protein. It's only been discovered a few years ago. But it does seem to be something that's got a lot of people's attention because that protein is not only present in the aggregates of patients with ALS, but it's also pre present in the aggregates of people with a completely different disease, frontal temporal dementia. And so this, this actually may wind up linking multiple neurodegenerative diseases. And so understanding what this protein does is going to be critical now 
There's a lot of people working on trying to figure out exactly what it's doing. Is it part of the plaques as well? And in uh, in uh, Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. Not that I know of, no. That's mostly beta amyloid protein. Well, I don't know with MS either, but I mean it's more on no, the side. No, it's, it's not an MS plaque either to my knowledge, no. Okay. Well, I was just curious, I mean, in vitro, I, you know, to do some sort of gene silencing to see its, you know, effects. I don't know if there have been studies done to see, you know, in a healthy animal, not, a, not even yeah. a model, just a healthy, a healthy rat, healthy mouse. I don't know. I've never seen a you knockout know. study. My, my suspicion is that it seems like it's such a, um, a prevalent protein. It or is it lethal? knockout is lethal, probably. Yeah. But I, I don't know for sure that that's been tried. I have never seen that mentioned at a meeting. I would imagine that it's lethal, and that's why I don't hear people talking about it. They're I was just thinking there's some of these shRNA studies where you can, you can titer the, the, the um, silencing of a gene. Yep. Um, and if that was something, you know, it would be interesting to know if you, yeah, it's a great idea. If you had a, you know, you had a, a model or something with, you know, the, the knowledge of the plaques, and you could show through imaging or, you know, sacrificing after the uh, decreased plaque formation. I think it's a great idea. Um, when I go to the next big ALS meeting, I'll see the, the people who are the protein chemists at the meeting and, and the geneticists, and see if they have any anything like that going on. They probably do, but talk to them about it. Yeah. United. It, it usually takes a, a minute or 10 seconds or something. But anyway, um, Rick, I really appreciate you um, coming and talking about this. It's just been very stimulating for me anyway um, to listen to this and to hear what's going on in the VA. And hopefully we will be able to work with you in the future to, uh, to move forward. So yeah. again, thank you so much for your time. Sure. My pleasure.